created to rule. Do you feel like a ruler? Does that feel like a good fit for you? Do you wake up every day and go, created to rule? The Bible talks about us ruling and reigning with Christ Jesus. And in Genesis 1, the account of our beginnings, we discover that mankind were created by God in his image and his likeness, and he blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over what's in the sea. Rule over what's in the sky. Rule over every living creature that moves in the ground. So it's definitely biblical that we are created to rule, but what does that mean? How is that supposed to work? And are you and I really the right people for the job? Today I'm starting this series to help us connect with this eternal kingdom truth and bring this truth into our daily reality. That it wouldn't just be a theory, it wouldn't be just a a slogan, it wouldn't just be some vague doctrine floating around in the scriptures, but that it would become our reality. And help us to get started on this, we're going to Tune into the teaching of the ruler of rulers, the king of kings, Jesus. In Luke 15, Jesus provides three parables to teach an important point. Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners. Quick note, going back 2,000 years ago, this is for the Jews Sinners, pretty obvious. Tax collectors, they separated out from the sinners to be the worst of the sinners. Just so you know, that's, they had some issues with them. Tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around. They wanted to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my last coin. And in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continues. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything. There was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, 
threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has fattened, uh, killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, All these years, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. Two things to consider before we get into the message. First of all, these are parables. A parable is not a true story. They're fictitious to teach or reveal a point. So we need to read parables in a way that seeks out what Jesus wanted to reveal to us or in us. I.e. there is treasure in the parable set apart for you to discover. Secondly, Jesus cleverly and very specifically used terminology, cultural context, and characters to more fully reveal truth and to reveal the heart of the listener, you. Sometimes we miss these things because the parable was created in a very particular context that is very different to ours. Hence why you've got a lot of parables about farmers and shepherds, uh, merchants, Uh, All those sorts of things, and it's not necessarily what you and I might be doing. So these parables in Luke 15 focus on someone losing something of value and then finding it again. The context was that the religious leaders were judging Jesus for including and spending time with sinners, those who the religious elite saw as worthy of judgment. Remember, it starts with now the tax collectors and sinners. We're all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They didn't think such people should be included or loved or given the opportunity to participate in the grace of God. So to reveal and then correct their perspective, Jesus gave three parables to clarify that such people were in fact a priority to God. God sent Jesus to save sinners. To God the Father, they are his children who are lost, lost from his family. Therefore, all heaven rejoices over even one of God's lost children who turns from sin to be restored to God. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now, the point isn't that righteous people are not valuable to God. It's the point of that we talk about there's someone who's lost. And so there's going to be great celebration that they're returned, restored. The father of the lost son, in verse 32, said, We had to celebrate and be glad because the brother of yours was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. The parable of the lost sheep connected in in those people familiar with the role of the ancient shepherd who led his sheep around the wilderness, leading them to green pastures, protecting them from wild animals, and would even call to them, and they would follow his voice. bit different from today's farming, right? In fact, the numbers weren't big like our big stations. And it wasn't just out in paddocks and fenced off and and they did their thing. The the shepherd would stay with the sheep 
and then take them once that pasture is used up, walk them to some other thing, walking them around in the, the wilderness, staying with them, camping with the sheep. The sheep, Jesus said, uh, knew the, the shepherd's voice. And the, the Jesus said that the shepherd would call to the sheep by name. That's a bit different from New Zealand farming, right? So we have to go back 2,000 years and think in the perspective that they'd have. In this parable, people could feel the distress the shepherd feels if he loses one of his sheep. He'll even leave the 99 in order to find just that one lost sheep. The lost coin parable draws in everyone because we hate losing money, right? And keep in mind, Jesus set up the parable so this is a woman. Woman didn't own anything. That's a bit different, isn't it? Generally, they said that the land was always passed through the male line, through the male name. And so that's why widows are such a big deal to God, because often they weren't well looked after, because they weren't the ones who had possessed the property. It would go back to the family. And so here's someone, she's got 10 silver coins. So the silver coins, not, they're not small coins, they're significant coins. But she's lost one coin. She's lost 10%. Just like you, if you had $1,000 and that's all you had and it was at home and you lost $100, you'd be pretty ticked off. It's not a 10 cent coin. You'd look, you'd turn the house upside down trying to find your 100 bucks. This is what was going on here. Then Jesus, with the final parable, concludes his response to those who devalued and rejected the sinner whom they didn't think was worthy of time, love, or attention. Jesus goes from talking about sheep and money to talking about a father who loses a son. And within this parable is loaded all sorts of snags for the cultural context and the self-righteous. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Birthright, inheritance, and property had more significant value in those times than they do for many in a New Zealand Pākehā society today. When you're considering the parable of the lost son, you need to keep in mind that what the son asks of the father is both significant and outrageous. Significance in terms of birthright and inheritance in the Bible. Consider Matthew twenty two thirty two, where Jesus says, Have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. The reference, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, is used regularly throughout the Old Testament. Why? These are the patriarchs of Israel and Judaism. This is a big deal. This is the foundation of Judaism. But the foundation of their legacy was uh, the promise God gave them for their nation. That promise was first given to Abraham that although he wasn't able to have children with his wife Sarah at that time, God promised him that he would have descendants. Many, many descendants. As many as the stars in the sky, he said. And from him... Generation after generation would come a nation and kings. They would have their own land as a kingdom, and all nations of earth will be blessed through them. Does that sound significant? That's a pretty tall promise. And the legacy of that promise was passed down to his eventual son, Isaac. And that promise was then passed down to Isaac's son, Jacob. But if you're not familiar with the story in Genesis chapter 21 to 35, it wasn't quite so simple. Abraham and Sarah tried to fulfill God's promise in their own ability through another woman, not Sarah, and it resulted in Ishmael, whom God said would not receive the birthright of his promise, even though Ishmael was the firstborn son. Only by miraculous provision by God did Sarah and Abraham finally in their old age have a son, Isaac. And it was Isaac who got to receive the promise God had given Abraham. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty important part of Scripture. You'll see it referred to again and again through the New Testament. Genesis. Uh, so then Isaac 
He, he has two sons, twins, Esau and Jacob. Esau was born first, so by custom, Esau, the firstborn son, would receive the birthright of the promise given originally to Abraham. You will become a nation with kings. All nations on earth will be blessed through them. However, Genesis chapter 5, we're just going to jump on that story briefly. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau, his brother, came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me hear some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom, which means red. Jacob replied, first, this is a crazy thing, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. And later, their father Isaac, before he dies, part of the custom is them that pronounce a blessing over the sons. Each son would get a blessing. And Jacob, with the help of his mum, tricks the father into the blessing that he's going to give to Esau, the oldest. He's tricked into giving it to Jacob. But Esau's treatment of the birthright birthright was appalling to the Jews. To trade the inheritance, the legacy, the ancestral culmination of previous generations for a bowl of food is seen as one of the most wicked things you could do to your family. What's more, in this situation, it wasn't a normal family birthright or inheritance. It was the promise of God to their forefather Abraham and his descendants for generations. They would have become God's own inheritance, his people, his nation, holy to him. So Esau at that time had no regard or value for the promise of God. That's why it says Esau despised his birthright. In other words, the Bible puts a highlighter through and says, just to be clear, This is what this guy did. To most indigenous cultures, the land, the wealth, the possessions, the position in society, and most importantly, the name of the family and the rule of the family clan are the most precious heritage that can be passed on. And to the Jews, birthright, the blessing, and inheritance given to the sons was as valuable as life itself because without it, you were nothing, you had nothing. So when you read the parable of the lost son, remember remember that the people of Jesus' day saw the topic of inheritance as very significant. This wasn't just about leaving some money behind. Now think about this parable in terms of outrage. First, the son asked the father for his inheritance before his time. That is... Your inheritance you receive after the death of your father. In that culture, those listening would have interpreted that, interpreted that audacious request as similar to wishing that his father was dead. Father, I wish you would die now so I could have my share of the property. Now, Jesus didn't say that, but he crafted the parable so those listening would have felt it and be outraged at the son's request. And Jesus didn't stop there. He's going for maximum offense here. He really wanted people to get upset with the son. Like Esau and the bowl of stew, the son takes the inheritance and throws it away on sin. He leaves his father. He leaves this holy land of promise that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob longed for. And he goes to a pagan country where they worship false gods. And he spends all his father gave for him from the legacy of the family in wild living. Remember it said, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And the translation of wild living in English comes from language that implies getting drunk, gambling away his money, and sleeping with prostitutes. 
So for the Jewish people listening to the story, they would have been appalled to hear of how the son treated his father, treated the legacy of the family, and the kind of sinful life he lived among the Gentiles, non-Jews. That's what Gentiles mean. It means it's just their way of saying non-Jews. So for, for you and I, if you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile, by the way. Everything about the younger son in the story was designed to paint him as the worst sinner that religious Jews could imagine. In fact, I think he's probably worse at this stage than the tax collectors even. Then to top it all off, what does he do next? When he runs out of money because he spent all the father had given him, he grew, grew hungry. It was a time of famine. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him, sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And again, Jesus loads us up with issues. For a start, Jews recognized non-Jews as unclean people. They weren't to mix with Gentiles. In a sense, they were people who worshipped other gods, false gods. They were did things that were shameful, so they weren't to mix with the Gentiles. And in Jesus and the apostles' time, Jews wouldn't even step inside a Gentile person's home. Hey, come on and have a cup of coffee. Uh, no, we don't associate with you. Here, the son not, not only mixes with them, but is now working for them. And what kind of work was it? Pig feeding. You might think, well, that wouldn't be much fun. True. But Jews thought of it as the lowest of the lowest forms of work, the most disgusting type of work, because a Jewish person was raised under the Judaic law, which made pigs an unclean animal. So you wouldn't eat pigs. In fact, they wouldn't farm pigs. They wouldn't own pigs. They had nothing to do with pigs. And here, this Jewish son is in this Gentile country feeding animals unclean animals. In fact, he wished he could even eat the food that the pigs were eating. So Jesus has painted a picture that he is at rock bottom. You can't go much lower than this. And I imagine that what it stirred up in the people was, yeah, serves you right, you rotten, wicked son. Eat with the pigs. You will never be cleansed from the shame of what you've done. You're exactly where you should be. Big man. Are you starting to get a feel for what Jesus was wanting to stir up in the listeners? And who were the listeners that Jesus was targeting? Who was he targeting? Do you remember? It's the religious elite, isn't it? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The three parables were aimed at These men, and that is, they are some of the most influential, well-trained, and most devout followers of the Holy Scriptures. They consider themselves sons of Abraham, and were totally committed to the Scriptures, but obviously were not understanding the heart of the author. And now Jesus is going to turn this parable on its head. When he came to his senses, we read, He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now remember, you're in a parable. That is, Jesus has made up the story with characters, cultural context, and terminology designed on purpose to reveal and to teach. And if you were wondering when I was going to get to the the message of created to rule, you're already in it. Listen again to what Jesus is doing here. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? So step back and look at the picture here. Remember, 
the start of this parable, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the father has an estate. He has only two sons, but he has hired servants. This man's father has an estate which he has hired servants to run. He has a significant property, in other words, servants who work for him as well as two sons. Can you see where this is heading? I'll sit out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. In the first parable, we read of a shepherd losing a sheep. The second parable was a woman losing a coin. This parable we read of a father losing a son. Keep that front of mind. The listeners 2,000 years ago were picking up on all these cues. In this parable, there were servants of the estate and there were sons of the estate. As you read this parable, I ask you, which one are you? Just a servant or a son, a daughter. Part of the key to this parable is understanding the difference in the types of characters that Jesus has used. There is one father, there are two sons, and there are servants of the estate. And of course, in the story, there's Gentiles as well. If you've turned from sin, receiving salvation and forgiveness for your sins through Jesus Christ, then Colossians 1 is for you, and it says who you are. It says, give joyful thanks, not to God, but to the Father. We're talking about the same person, yes, but the language matters. To the Father, who has qualified you to share in the estate, the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Are you picking up now on the language? The language matters. The characters matters. Jesus handpicked these characters for his story. There's a father, there's sons, and there's servants. And you need to find out where you are in the story. Jesus came to save sinners from sin and the dominion of the kingdom of darkness so that they might be restored to their father. The lost son in the parable was a son, not a servant. He was always a son, a child to the father. He was never an employee of the father, even though he served in the estate. Are you seeing your life as just a servant of God? Is that all you are? Saved from sin into an employment agreement with God. Where if you do the right things, if you get the jobs done, that you will get paid with salvation and get your ticket to heaven. Does that sound like sonship or employment? My children were born to me. I didn't hire them in. You, in Christ Jesus, were born again, we're told. Born to who? Born to God the Father. You're not an employee of God. You're not just a servant of God. See what great love the Father has lavished on you that you'd be called a child of God. And that is why you are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. John 1, Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, have you received Jesus? To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. How many people in New Zealand are on the search for their identity? 
How big a deal is that in today's social climate? Sexual identity, gender identity, identity through career, identity through gang patches, identity through social media likes and YouTube followers, identity through mental health or disability label, cultural identity, people talking about, I need to find myself. Get a mirror and GPS, you're right there. Labels, tags, communities, families, cultures, political alignment, even religious identification. What's going on? Instinctively and now more than ever, we are discovering we have an identity crisis in modern society. We're trying to discover who we are, what are our values, why do we exist? That's what happens when a people group who've rejected their creator discover they no longer have a basis for existence. If you're here by random chance, what's your identity? Why are you here? Who are you? With all of modern science's developments and theories, science has no answer for who am I? Why am I here? To what do I belong? Without clarity and confidence in these fundamentals, we get desperate and begin to fill the void with anything and everything. I just need a label. I need to fit somewhere. Friend, you, above all other identifications, are first and foremost a child of of God. And the more you unpack that truth, the more you discover of the most glorious treasure that you were created for. In the parable of the lost son, Jesus is following the religious elite who believes by their ethnic origins, their religious position, and their righteous works that they have earned a place in God's kingdom. And that this terrible, sinful reject of Jewish society was always and continued to be a son to the Father just rocked their world. It was, this was something that they couldn't wrap their heads around. Remember, they had titles, teacher of the law, Pharisees. They identified with Judaism. They were sons of Abraham. They even had the badge on. Pharisee, teacher of the law, respected in my community. And yet, Jesus was saying that the sinner in the story was also a son. Jesus wants you to know, even at your worst, you are still a child of God. You are loved by him, and nothing can change your identity as his child. Your true identity can't even be changed by you or your actions. Have you been working or living for an identity or from an identity? Consider the language Jesus is using in this parable. You don't have a position with God, you have a relationship. The hired servants couldn't turn up at the dinner dinner table and say, Hi, Dad. Hired servants couldn't say, I want my share of the estate. The key to all this in the parable is relationship. That's what's been drawn out here. Think again about Jesus' death on the cross in light of this parable. We know Jesus' death on the cross saved you from the power and penalty of sin. You, even your death, could not save you from the power and penalty of your sin. Jesus did that for you on the cross. But I put to you that the primary purpose Jesus died on the cross was not just to save you from your sin, although that's what he did, but Jesus died on the cross to save you from being lost from God your Father. The parable of a shepherd who had lost a sheep, the parable of a woman who had lost a coin, and the parable of a father who what? Lost a son. Luke 19.10 For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. We often default to thinking of people being lost to sin. The bigger issue is people being lost from God, from relationship. 
lost from their relationship with their eternal Heavenly Father. People not realizing who they are, the access they have to the creator of heaven and earth, the love that is theirs, the estate that belongs to them, and the heritage that is promised to them. Back to Colossians 1, give joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to what? Share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. So we're in Colossians 1. But surely we're also in Luke 15 in the parable of the lost son at the same time, aren't we? When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and I'm starving to death? I'll sit out and go back to my father, not my employer, not my boss, not the president, to my dad. I'm going back to him. And I'll say to him, Sorry, Dad, I've sinned against heaven against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Can you hear it? He's trying to trade his identity for belonging. No longer worthy to be a son. Just make me a hired servant. If you're a dad, you know that's impossible. I can't change you. You're my son. You're born to me, and nothing can change that. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with what? Anger? Disgust. Disappointment. Shamed of his son. No. His father is looking for him, sees him a long way off. Hoping the son will return. Finally, he sees his son coming back to him. And he's filled with compassion. Filled with compassion for his son. He runs to his son, throws his arms around him. He kisses him. Now, how shocked do you think the Pharisees and the teachers of the law would be when they hear Jesus clearly announcing that God the Father has compassion on the people the Jews thought of as the worst of sinners? Is this how you think God sees you? Is your God the Father who runs towards you, who throws his arms around you, who hugs and kisses you with delight? Now, I try and be a good dad to my kids, but I'm definitely not that good. God the Father is more compassionate, more affectionate, more forgiving, more devoted to you than any earthly father ever can be. That's just who he is. But maybe you've believed a lie about your identity, that you're not really like a child in whom God delights, but more, you're, you're more of a servant of whom God requires and rewards. Or maybe you're like the son in this parable who says to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Are you just a servant of God working for God? earning your ticket to live on his estate, or are you a sinner no longer worthy to be called a child of God? Regardless of how you feel or what you think or what you've done or what others say about you, your identity does not change. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. That is what we are. That is what we are. In the parable, the man does not run to wrap his arms around an employee. He's running because this is his son. He wraps his, wraps his arms around him because of his compassion for his son, not his frustration, anger, disappointment, or shame. It's because the recipient is his child, not a servant, that the man kisses him. Now, here's the thing. The son is correct when he says, I have sinned against heaven and against You, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He has sinned against God and the promise God gave to this man through Abraham. He has sinned against his father. Absolutely he is guilty. By his heart and by his action, this man is no longer worthy to be called son. You and I, by our rejection of God and the promise of offered to us through Jesus, and by the things we have done and thought, are not worthy of being called son or daughter of God. We are worthy of the shame, the guilt, and the punishment our sins deserve. But, 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 Romans says, 
God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we're still rejecting him, while we're still in sin, Jesus died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See what great love the Father has lavished in you. The father in the parable did not run, wrap his arms around and kiss the man because he was pleased with his behavior or had proved worthy of his father's affection. The father did it because the man was his child in whom he loved. We don't prove our worth as children. It's because we are children that we have worth. That is why he saved you out of sin because you are his child. You don't prove worthy for him to save you. You're just his kid. He loves. Now, we're not yet ready to finish this parable today. We'll do that next week. But if we're ever to understand what it means to be created to rule, you must first understand who you are in relationship to God. If you're going to look at these scriptures and look at the kingdom and look at your life out of some transaction between you and God, you as a servant, you as an employee, or some kind of agreement, you're going to miss it. It's because of your relationship. It's because you're a child of God. Everything in the kingdom of God flows out of a relationship, not a contract, not a law, not a role. Jesus went to the cross not to make you a son or daughter of God, but because you are a son of God or daughter of God. He went to the cross because you already are. He was trying to save, redeem, restore his lost children. The covenant of Jesus' blood is what restores you back into the relationship. That's why Jesus set the parable up with the father running to the sinful son and hugging and kissing kissing his son before the son even gets to confess his sin. Did you notice the timing? The father's running to the son, wraps his arms around him and kisses him, and then the son starts to confess his sin. The father's love runs first. He's always the initiator. It's because of his love that we're saved. Jesus went to the cross to save you from ever being lost from your heavenly father. And now that you're back, he wants you to understand the estate, his kingdom, that is yours because you're not a servant you're a son you're a daughter let's respond how's your relationship with God going have you been trying to prove good enough for God Prove good enough to receive from him. Prove good enough before you ask of him. How many people struggle to ask God for things so we're not sure if we're good enough? Maybe if I just do a bit better, maybe if I work a bit harder, maybe if I get a bit better, then I'll be more confident to ask. Well, that's the wrong way around. Ask a two-year-old. doesn't matter what the two-year-old's been doing. doesn't matter how poorly behaved. They're going to ask for stuff, correct? And they won't even ask rudely. They don't really care. They're just going to say it. This is what I want. You are the, you're the father. You're the mother. And therefore, you should give it to me. They get it. As simple as it might be, as crude as it might be, they get it. I'm your child. You're my parent. So, of course, you must give it to me. It's a bit heartbreaking when you say no because they, it's kind of, but I thought you are and I am, so therefore, come on. Have we lost something as we get a bit older? To where I can't ask God because I haven't been very good. I haven't prayed enough prayers. I haven't said enough. I haven't read enough scripture. I haven't been morally correct enough. I haven't been focusing enough. I haven't. We go through all our problems and failures. The father wasn't going through all the problems and failures of the son. The son was. The son was, wasn't he? I'm going to go to my father. I'm going to say, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. He's going through his list of his failures. 
The father isn't looking for failures. The father's just looking for the son. He sees the son a long way off. He runs to the son, to the son with compassion, wraps his arms around him. He isn't looking for a list of the sins. He isn't looking for a list of confessions. Now, we need to confess our sin. That's part of how we get free. We need to get that stuff out, right? But the father just loves you because who you are in relationship to him. He just wants you back. That's why he wants us set free from sin so we can be brought fully into a relationship where the Bible says you can come confidently to his throne of grace and find help. You can come boldly, confidently to his throne. Other people can't. In fact, in a lot of the Old Testament cultures, if you were to approach the throne of a king without being summoned, you just get your head chopped off. They'd literally kill you. So when you read in Hebrews that you can come confidently to the throne of God, the throne of grace, it's going, no, I can't. Yes, you can. How? Because a son can. A daughter can. That's who you are. Let's bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I just pray for us right now that we'd have more accuracy about what's going on in our thinking, our perspective, and our heart. And Lord, for people this morning that need to come back into this truth, to have this truth transform them from the inside out. That they always have been your child. But at one point, that we'd separate ourselves through our sin. And yet, you love us so much, you sent your son to make a way to bring us back into relationship. Because you miss us, because you love us. Holy Spirit, we need your help right now to reveal this again. Have I been slipping into a false identity, an old identity, someone else's thinking even, where I'm behaving like I'm a servant rather than a son or daughter, where I'm behaving like I'm an employee, a hired person, when actually I'm a child of God? Is that you this morning? Would you like to come back into that relationship? Maybe you've never been in a relationship with God. Maybe this is all new to you. Or the Father is calling out for you to come home to him. Maybe you've been a Christian for decades, but living in a way that's really not a relationship, but as someone who's just got a religious identity trying to do the right thing. Or maybe you're Having me able to live in that relationship with God because you don't see yourself worthy of it. You're not good enough. You haven't done enough. And this morning you want to actually just come back into the Father's arms and be restored to relationship. Because it's his love that changes us, not our best efforts. It's his grace. This morning, is there someone here that needs to come back to God and be restored? Just to bring yourself as you are to the Father and receive his love. It's his arms around you. It's his love. It's his grace that changes your heart. It changes your perspective. It changes you from the inside out. In fact, the Bible says that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's his goodness that helps us change, in other words. I'm going to finish by putting a song on the screen and just as that song's playing, I just want you to bring your whole heart to God this morning. And if you know that actually you haven't been living in this relationship with the right perspective, maybe you've been missing things, maybe you just feel distant from God and you just want to be restored to that relationship, then during the song, can I encourage you just to come up the front? Bring your whole life with you. Bring your heart with you. Bring your troubles with you. Bring your weaknesses with you. Bring your brokenness. Bring your fears. Bring your success. Bring it all. Just come as you are and let the Father love you and transform you.